So good evening, everyone. Mm -hmm. We have no, no microphone. So, mm -hmm. so you have to bring a little stuff you want to hear. You have to come here, of course. Uważajcie na tę kamerę. Nie mogę jej przesunąć po prostu. Aha, ty zostawiam. You can't plug in over here. Much closer. Just call me Zibi. <laughs> Zibi. Yeah, it would be easier for you. <laughs> nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. His brother of Anadi. His brother of Anadi. Anadi Krishna. Anadi. Oh, there he is. Nice day. <laughs> any any question tonight? Uh, I have a question about chanting because uh um Chantamani he describes three stages of chanting. Nama Paratha, Nama Asa, and Shukana. But recently I read a book of Satyanarayana Kavadi, Nama Tatma. And he said that there is no such things like stages in chanting because when you chant Nama Paratha, one of the kind of Nama has is to refer to some, something else, uh, like diorama in English, for example. So it can be pa uh, part of sadhana, bhakti. So there is no such things as uh, like stages of chanting. So, mm -hmm. so you wonder about that? Yeah, because uh, usually we're thinking that at the beginning we are chanting Nama Paratha and then when we get a little purified we chant in Nama Path and finally we shoot Hanama. But, but uh, he's saying that this is not, not, there's not such thing. So. No. <laughs> uh, Pani Nama Chintamani, Bhaktivinu Thakur, opisuje, że są jakby trzy etapy w intonowaniu świętych imion. Nama Paratka, Nama Pasa i Siódka Nama. A ostatnio czytałem książkę napisaną przez Sofię Narajana w obozie Nama Tatwa. I opisuję, że nie ma takiego etapy w intonowaniu, ze względu na to, że na przykład gdy intonujemy Nama Pasa, tam są różne rodzaje Nama Pasa, ale jedną z Nama Pasa jest nieintencjonalne wypowiadanie imienia, jakby wskazuje na coś innego, tak jak w przypadku Ajamili. Ajamila intonował imię swojego syna, a uzyskał tylko intonowanie na Mahasa. Więc czy są ostatecznie etapy w intonowaniu, czy, czy nie? First of all, um, there are different sects within our Sampradaya. And sometimes you'll find different emphases. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. 
we may learn some aspect of the teaching in a particular way and find that it's taught somewhat differently in another sect. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's wrong. It might be, but not necessarily, because there are different ways of applying oneself. There are different details that can be changed and altered and should be and must be in different times and different circumstances. And then there's an underlying uh, principle that needs to be maintained and supported by the adjustment of different details. And there's something called theology also, where we reason about revelation and speak about it in an ongoing way to bring to continue to shed light on the essence of what the revelation is saying, what Shastra is saying. It's like if you have a, a, a lotus flower and you put the sun on it, it opens and opens, opens. So the Shastra is like that. It, it opens and opens and opens and opens. Mm -hmm. With the light of um, um, realized devotees' explanations. Mm -hmm. Now, that said, sometimes for the sake of explaining and motivating students to engage in those activities transrational activities of sadhana that will bring them to a level whereby they can understand something that without that practice they will have difficulty understanding. In order to do that, sometimes we find in almost all Gaudiya sects, some kind of preaching strategy may also be invoked. Our Paribar coming from Bhakti Vinod is particularly characterized by its outreach and uh, its ideal of making devotees in Poland. <laughs> and uh, we can see that it was successful. Mm -hmm. So we are very happy about that. In order to accomplish that, um, Bhakti Vinod Thakur spoke in certain ways, invoked certain preaching strategies, and um, overall, it was successful. It is important in time to understand the shelf life of a preaching strategy. And when it no longer serves its purpose to compel devotees to, again, practice and thereby know what they might not otherwise be able to understand through explanation, perhaps. And that is the call, if you will, or the decision of a great Acharya, like Bhakti Vinod, for example. This kind of uh, uh, preaching strategy is not something that is unique, as I say, to Bhakti Vinod. 
um, although he had very good reason for employing different preaching strategies um, because he had wanted to accomplish a couple of things that were significant. One, he wanted to wrestle the authority of Gaudiya Vaishnavism out of the hands of those who were the authorities at the time in Bengal. Authorities who were not doing anything to deal with the modern world. And who in some cases were acting and teaching in such a way as to cause Gaudiya Vaishnavism to be undesirable in the minds of pious, educated Hindus in its homeland in West Bengal. And he wanted to change that. And so he wanted to wrestle away, take away, and, and really, in effect, become an authority um, for Gaudiya Vaishnavism. And at the same time, while wrestling authority away from those who had the authority, he wanted to interact with the modern world in terms of its thoughts, its uh, technologies, its um, cultural sensibilities, and he wanted to do both of these things or these were two of the things that he tried to do, wanted to do, in order to place Gaudiya Vaishnavism on the world stage with Christianity, with uh, Islam. <clears throat> you understand? That was a huge ambition because as I say, even in West Bengal, the homeland of Gaudiya Vaishnavism, it was not well respected. If a Gaudiya Baba came to the door begging alms, then a pious Hindu wife would ask the servant, who is at the door? Oh, it's a Gaudiya. Oh, give him some fruit and send him away. Nothing to learn from them. These are the people who have no caste. And so they run and say they are followers of Chaitanya. The Bhakti Vinod had an epiphany when he, when he studied Chaitanya Charitamrita, the book that he had learned to loathe, Srimad Bhagavatam. He now saw it in a new light in light of the teaching and example by which he taught, example and teaching of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And it made him, a, it enabled him to understand the Bhagavatam in a way that, that not only had he not understood before, but turned him 180 degrees around because he had learned to think that the Bhagavatam was where Hinduism went south. This is the, was the British opinion. The British were occupying India at the time. And they were Christians. And they had Christian missionaries. And they were trying to convert the heathens. 
and especially away from this playboy, Krishna. I mean, think about it. If you heard that there was a guy living on an island off the Baltic, in the Baltic Sea, and he was, he was, his main focus was to dance at night with other people's wives, and people were calling him God. You might think, oh my God, <laughs> what's going on there? So, Bhagavatam is a rich text, but it requires some explanation. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu explained it by his own example and by his precept in a powerful, powerful way that turned the educated and pious Bhakti Vinod 180 degrees around and he became a Bhagavat, a devotee. And, and he became so filled with appreciation for the, the, the beauty of the Bhagavat, the, the, profa the, prof the, the, the profundity of, of the text, the depth of the text, that he felt compelled to bring it to the whole world. His idea was Gaudiya Vaishnavism should be on the world stage, the stage of world religions. Hmm? And having placed Gaudiya Vaishnavism on the stage to reveal that amongst the world religions, it exemplified the zenith of transcendental possibility. So he adopted a perennialist perspective. The perennialist perspective is one in which we identify a current that runs through all the major traditions uh, that have a mystical uh, side to them. Sufism of Islam, esoteric Christianity, esoteric uh, Buddhism, Vedanta. This term perennialism actually comes from Catholicism, early Catholicism. Later in the in the early, very early, maybe 20th century, uh, a book was written by Aldous Huxley called The Perennial Philosophy, which popularized the idea in, in modern times. And Bhaktivinoda Thakur embraced this kind of perspective. He said that, that according to the revelation of the East, and he referred to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu as the Eastern Savior, and according to the revelation of the East, the Upanishads, the Godhead is called Rasa. Rasa Vaisa. He had a theistic perennialist perspective. He, he coined the term Nir Darshan. In this, he honored all the different cultural expressions of religion in which there was mysticism and mystics, experiential practitioners like the Catholic saints, like the Buddhists, uh, like the Buddha, uh, uh, like the, the Sufi masters, and so Rumi, for example. Um, and Actually, if you look at them all, there's only a few ego-effacing religious traditions. You can find ego-effacement in Buddhism, in, in Christianity, primarily in Catholicism. 
um, in in uh, in uh, where we have so many saints, and uh, in uh, uh, in Sufism and uh, so Islam, like this. So there's a few. Hmm? <coughs> Ego effacing means that they posit a, an ideal of of love that's wise. Because the expression of love that arises out of the ignorance of attachment is not really love. It's not wise, it's ignorant. You understand? Ignorance means attachment. I want enduring happiness. I cannot get it in relation to things that do not endure. And which things endure? No things. <laughs> no thing. So, some wisdom. Therefore, with, with, with wisdom, with knowledge, jnana comes by ragya, detachment from things. That's wise. This is what the Buddha said. He was very wise. He's the head of God. Krishna is the heart. Buddha is the head. So, different faces of the Godhead in the major religious traditions. Within those traditions, there's a mystical, experiential side that unfortunately is often at odds with the religious expression. Do you understand? So the religious people, rather than mystical people, they tend to fight with one another over their different religions. We dress like this, you dress like that, you have the wrong tilak, you must be wrong. Hmm? They fight over these things. Bhaktivinoda called this Barabahi. Speaking about his own tradition, Vaishnavas who carry a heavy burden of sectarian identification hmm? that doesn't enable them to appreciate others in different sects who are pursuing essentially the same ideal. So we see this in the world, this religious uh, fighting and so forth. But we don't find the fighting amongst the mystics. We don't fight Catholic saints fighting with, with Hindu saints. We find that, that when they get together, they have some common ground. Hmm? You understand? And this is the common ground, that the conventional ego that says, I am Polish, I am Indian, I am American, I am Hindu, I am Catholic. Hmm? That is effaced. And so amongst these different traditions, they appear in different cultures. They worship the, the Godhead or approach the Godhead in, in different ways, nuanced ways. But there's much common ground. There's differences, important differences. But there's some common ground. When I say that Bhakti Vinodhaku embraced a theistic form of perennialism, what I mean is, and he invoked the term near darshan. Hmm? Darshan means to see God, the beatific vision, to use a Catholic term, hmm? to have arrived. We would say the beatific vision that is aspired for by the Catholics is called Shantarasa. In Shantarasa, we just like to look at God, just the form. There is no interest in the guna, the qualities, or the leelas, or any movement. Shanti, 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 peaceful. Passive adoration. <coughs> I think if we looked very carefully through the Gaudiya lens at the Catholic saints, we would see, oh, this is where they're arriving. 
This is what ideal they're positing. Shantarasa. Bhakti we know the Bhagavatam says about the avatars, they are asamkya. Uncountable. Uncountable faces of God. Bhakti we know said in appearing in different cultures and different traditions in different ways and the way in which they perceived the Godhead if the tradition was ego effacing and therefore wise the way in which they described the Godhead the way in which they understood the, the Paravyom the spiritual dimension and spoke about it um, and depicted it in art and literature and so forth. That, that those cultural depictions, if you will, were not something that had nothing to do with the ideal. In other words, he did not embrace a form of perennialism that all washed out in Nirvisesh Brahma, qualityless Brahman. In modern times, perennialism has become more to be identified with Advaita Vedanta. Hmm? That's how, but that's how, that's not, not so good, but that's how big Hinduism is. What a big uh, house it is. What a big umbrella it is. The more your religious tradition becomes mystical and experiential, the more it starts to look like Hinduism. <laughs> That's a fact. There are some Catholic uh, missionaries who went to India and ended up living there and, and having temples and they had Arctic for Jesus. Um, the famous uh, theologian Thomas Merton he went to India to learn some method for meditating and employ that within his Catholicism so India that is the mother of religion really so rich and in, in, in itself as a tradition is diverse Therefore, it tends to embrace diversity of religious expression. Abrahamic religions, by contrast, tend to be more exclusive. Hinduism tends to be more inclusive. As I said, there's a mystical side to each of the traditions, and then there's a religious side. There's a spiritual experiential side, and then just a religious side. Hmm? This is true in Hinduism as well. We have the karma mark. That's just the religious side. Oh God, give me my daily bread. Oh Son, Namaskar, make me healthy. Hmm? We have that. We find that also in Christianity, for example. But we also find in Christianity some mystics, right? St. Francis. Of Assisi, and this one and that one. Extraordinary, extraordinary people. And in Hinduism, we have mystics. One of the significant differences, I believe, is that in many traditions, you will find, from the West in particular, that the religious side tends to fight with the mystical side, and therefore, the, the savior of the Middle East is like this. <laughs> He's a mystic within, within uh, uh, what's it called? Hebrewism? Judaism. And the Jews, the, the religious Jews, took the mystical Jew 
and crucified him. So sometimes the religious orientation doesn't enable if one, it's meant to take one from that orientation, you're supposed to graduate to a mystical orientation, to an experiential orientation. But oftentimes it doesn't happen like that. And so uh, even the Islam, I Islamic, they don't like the Sufis. The Sufis come out of Islam, <laughs> mixed with, it, with Hinduism, and, and they have Sufism. So, but the, the interesting thing, I believe, um, as an aside, within Hinduism, it's really built into Hinduism very strongly that there is a mystical side. Mm. It's very strong. There's so many mystics in India. Mm. It, it, it lends itself more readily to be, not to be misunderstood, the mystical side, but to be seen as, as from karma we go to jnana. Mm. Jnana is not about things, right, or thoughts. It's about the self. Mm. The best things in life are not things, it said. So that's just a, a beautiful thing about, about Hinduism. Mm. And so, Bhaktivinoda, he felt that all the different traditions are not such that their particular expression of religion, their artistic depiction of their ideal is something that just disappears in the end and we end up, whether you're a Catholic or a Buddhist or a Hindu or a Gaudiya, in near Vishesh, near Guna, it is near Guna, but near Vishesh, without any differentiation, just merging in the Brahman. In other words, this is, this is a particular perennialist kind of perspective, if you follow me, that all the different religions are just different ways of trying to talk about something that's beyond speech, trying to think about something that's beyond thought, and when you use those tools, of certain types of thought and thinking, art and music and language and prayer and so forth, then you become silent and you go beyond and everyone emerges in Brahman. But this was not Bhaktivinoda's idea of perennialism. He had a theistic perspective on perennialism and therefore he, he coined the term near darshan. Near darshan means to see, to have the vision, to see the... To, to, to to uh, to have anubhav experience hmm, of the absolute, and his position was, as per the Bhagavatam, theistic, and God it has many faces, hmm, and the way in which we talk about him and so forth. This is this is not something to be dismissed altogether, but it's something that that is near darshan. It's like a like a shadow of the truth, of the, of the whole thing. It's a, it's, a, it's a semblance of it. So Krishna Leela has talked about, it's recorded in the Bhagavatam, written about by the Goswamis, and so forth, is an approximation of what that Leela is about. It's more than that. It's beyond talk. But these are empowered ways that we find in the Bhagavatam and in the Leela Grantas of the Goswamis of talking about the ideal of Leela and Madhurya Leela, sweet Leela. Hmm? And because they're empowered by persons who are experiencing it and trying to speak about it, those empowered descriptions have inherent power in them and they contain and constitute a semblance of what the actual darshan is like. So they have real spiritual currency. They are not something that, oh, you meditate on Krishna and then you become perfect and then the Leela disappears and, and you're all just sitting there and there's nobody there and it's just quiet. <laughs> not like that. And so 
he acknowledged that this was a possibility also in other um, uh, cultures where ego-effacing traditions took, uh, took root mm -hmm. within Europe amongst the Catholics and in Middle East among the Sufis, for example, uh, and, and so on. Mm -hmm. And so we have Shivas and Brahmas and they have Archangels and Peter. And it's all possible. This is a very broad and accommodating idea, but it is an idea that it embraces an essential truth. We cannot look at some of the Catholic mystics and just say, oh, they're in Maya. They're not, they're not devotees. <laughs> they're, they're having some real experience, or as Sufis like Rumi, others, and so forth. So, as, of course, as Godi, as we already, and Hindus, we already accept that there are so many different possibilities. You can worship Ram, Krishna, hmm? Narasimha, Vamana, this one, that one. Hmm? And all, as a point also worth making, all these religious traditions, even Buddhism and Advaita Vedanta, which tend to be non-theistic, are also theistic to some extent. Obviously, in Sufism or in Islam, there is there is there is a personality of Godhead. In Christianity, there's a personality of Godhead. In Bhakti tradition, there's a personality of Godhead: Narayan, Varaha, Nasinga, Ram, Krishna, Dwarakesh Krishna, Mataresh Krishna, Vrindavan Krishna. So many possibilities. So many faces of the Godhead. Hmm? But also in Advaita Vedanta, there's a personality of Godhead. And who is the fullest personality of Godhead in Advaita Vedanta? Krishna, the poor Navatar. In Advaita Vedanta, of course, they think, Shankar thinks, that Brahman appears as Ishwar, God, in the world. And the fullest form of Ishwar is Krishna. And he accepts that Krishna's appearance in the world is a, is, is a historical kind of reality. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Krishna within the Vedanta Vedanta is a provisional Krishna. But everything that you require to believe in a transcendent personality of Godhead is also required to believe in a provisional personality of Godhead. Hmm? Do you understand? Within Buddhism also, if you want Buddhism, you also have to accept personalities, hmm? divine personalities that transcend your experience with a number of heads and hands and, 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 and so forth. Because Buddhism accepts a mind mind stuff. It has two tiers of matter, just like Vedanta. Physical matter and psychic matter, both of them. Hmm? If there's no psychic matter, there's no reincarnation to Buddhism. Hmm? And if you don't know anything about psychic matter, like most people in the scientific community know nothing about psychic matter, tend to deny that it even exists. <coughs> Some are beginning to posit it, that it does exist as a, as a category of matter because they cannot take mind and show that it's physical matter. They're having a real hard time doing that. To reduce mind, to say that mind is really just a brain. That's all it is. There's really no such thing as a mind. There's just a brain. They've been trying to do this for some time and they're having a very hard time doing it. So now they, there's some starting to posit, well, maybe there's another category of matter, psychic matter. Hmm? But see, this is a huge problem in modern science because then suddenly we know nothing. Oh, there's a whole other compartment of matter, we don't know anything about it, and it doesn't work in the way physical matter does that enables us to feel like 
we're on solid ground here. <laughs> we, we, we know what we're doing. Suddenly, everything's up for grabs again. They're ghosts. Now what? <laughs> but uh, you, cannot, you cannot do away with psychic matter and be a Buddhist. Hmm? Although Buddhism tends to work kind of well with materialistic, uh, quantum, mechanic perspective, and doesn't necessarily, in its form of Zen, have a lot of religious baggage, but it's got subtle matter, that's for sure. I have seen some Buddhists who try to say, actually, uh, they're intimidated by modern science, and, and, and they say, actually, it's not necessary that reincarnation has to be part of our Buddhism. <laughs> This is where, you know, you might as well just throw it out altogether. Huh? So, no, there is reincarnation in Buddhism. In Buddhism, this mind, just like in Vedanta, the mind goes to another physical body. Of course, in Vedanta, there's an Atma that's being carried by the mind and psychic matter into the next physical body and so forth. Hmm? Um, so it's a little different. Um, but my point is, that in Buddhism also there is subtle matter, and in subtle matter there's all kinds of things going on hmm, that are very different. Therefore you have the goddess Tara and this goddess and that and so forth, and especially within um, the, uh, for example, the Tibetan Buddhism, you have a provisional Amitabha Buddha, for example, hmm, in Pure Land Buddhism, you have a provisional personality of God. That's even addressed by Rupa Goswami in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. He says, quoting the Purana, Shruti Smriti Purana Adi Panchara Tiki Birimbina Oikanti Hare Bhakti Patyai Bhakalpate. He says, this is what it means. He says, those who worship Buddha hmm, as the personality of Godhead but dismiss the Vedas, hmm, they're not really Bhaktas. Because Bhakti is based on faith in the Veda, in Revelation. Shastriya Shraddha, Shraddha in, in Revelation. The Buddhists tend to dismiss the Upanishads. So, but there's some of them that worship the Buddha. He said, that's not what we're talking about, is Bhakti. But, the point is anyway, in Buddhism there's also a provisional personality of God. In the way to Vedanta, there's a provisional personality of God. And the fullest form of, of that Ishvara is Krishna. Hmm? Then you go to the Vaishnavas, who are the majority of the Vedantists. Right? Sri Vaishnavism, uh, Madhva's Vaishnavism, Marka. Brahma Gaudi and so forth. They're the majority. They all has it a eternal personality of Godhead. Narayan, Krishna, different avatars and so forth. Christianity is very theistic, although there's not much description about the Godhead himself. It's a it's a very um, prominent uh, point. Passive adoration is also a kind of service. Shantarasa is a form of bhakti. Mm -hmm. And you have Islam and so forth. So Bhakti Vinod said, hey, if you really want to talk about the perennial philosophy, in other words, that essential spiritual experiential reality that appears in different cultures, in different places, in different traditions, if we look carefully at it, it's talking, it's theistic. More than not, there are two traditions that are only provisionally theistic, the rest are fully theistic, and the full base of theism comes to Rasaraj, Bhagavan, Sri Krishna. So this was his strategy. Hmm? He said, we're all in this together. Meanwhile, Gaudiya Vaishnava, nobody ever heard of. And he's saying, yeah, Christianity is great. They have the Sakyarasa. 
brotherly love. They have the, like Prabhupada said, they have Mother Mary. She is a manifestation of Radha. This is a preaching strategy. <laughs> you understand? Bhakti Vinod felt, I have to find common ground with the existing religions on the world stage, hmm? find common ground with my Bodhi of Vaishnavism, <laughs> and then get out, so how I'm going to get on the stage, how I will get Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's teaching on the world stage. So he said, and what we are talking about here, it's talked about in this, it's talked about in this tradition in a slightly different way and so forth. And we, we embraced the, all the traditions and he was a harmonizer in this way. And he was successful and because why there are devotees in Poland. <laughs> That's what he wanted to do. That's a pretty amazing thing. Hmm? And there were, and even the tradition, as I say, was not respected in its homeland, in West Bengal. Mm -hmm. And of course, beyond Poland and the Americas and the rest of Europe, South America, and everywhere. Mm -hmm. This is our particular sect of Gaudiya Vaishnavism. It is a hugely successful Puribhar, family lineage of Vaishnavism. Prabhupada, my Guru said, my movement is the movement of Bhakti Binod. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur told his disciples when they were asked which Paribar, which lineage within Gaudi Vaishnavism are you in? He said, you tell them we're in the Bhakti Vinod Paribar. Hmm? Like they might have Narutam Paribar, Shamananda Paribar, hmm? um, Bhakti Vinod Paribar. And it's particularly um, characterized by this interest in, 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 in wide uh, dissemination of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's teaching. And through that wide dissemination, it has given currency to all the different forms of Vaishnavism and to Gaudiya Vaishnav sects who are not involved in outreach per se. Now when you're not involved in outreach very much, and you live a contemplative life, then when speaking or writing, if you do write about Gaudiya Vaishnavism, you might be more inclined to cross your T's and dot your I's. If you're write, writing for a big audience and for people who never heard of what you're talking about at all, your presentation is going to be a little different. If you're out in the market and somebody sees your neck beads, you have to wear them prominently. They protect you. And someone says, oh, those are nice beads. Where did you get them? What are they about? What do they represent? Then you go, where do I start? <laughs> oh, goodness. You have to use your mind. And you have to say something. Hmm? You're not going to say everything. You're not going to say it in great detail. You're going to say something and you're going to hope that they're going to go, Oh, that's cool. I like that. Mm -hmm. And they say, Okay, have a nice day. And it's a start. <laughs> they think, Those beads look nice. Mm -hmm. I heard something about that. There's a sacred bead. People wear them. Anyway, you understand the point. This is what our party bar has been engaged in. And so sometimes, in order to preach, we invoke some strategy. We tell a half-truth, we tell a partial, not the whole thing, and, and we try to get people to take prasad, <laughs> to chant, and, and so forth. So Bhakti Vinod is doing this in a big way. When my Guru Maharaj said, yes, and Mary, she's a manifestation of Radha, this is a preaching kind of strategy. You can't go and find that in the Bhagavatam. <laughs> Wait a minute, this is not Siddhanta. He's wrong. <laughs> no, he's right. <laughs> he's right. You have to understand what he's doing, what's on his mind as a great Vaishnava. What is his uh, 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 service as he sees it? Uh, to, uh, 
my guru Maharaj was asked by Bhakti Siddhanta Sastatapa to preach in, in the world widely. Nirvisesha Sunyavadi, Pastatade Satarane. So, our party bar is a little different than other lineages. We are the only lineage that does this, preaching widely. And what you find, if someone from the Bhakti Vinod Party Bar leaves the Bhakti Vinod Party Bar because they don't understand it fully, or because it was misrepresented by someone, we have that unfortunately that happens. Some people misrepresent the, the, the lineage of Bhakti Vinod. That's unfortunate. So some sincere person may think, be discouraged. I came, I gave myself here, and then I found a teacher, but he was misrepresentative, Misre misrepresenting. So they may go to another party bar. Then they find, oh, they say it differently here a little bit, same but different, and so forth. So there, that happens. Hmm? And, 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 and both in a positive way and kind of a negative way, <laughs> Our party bar is giving currency to other party bars who don't preach. And what happens when the members of this party bar leave the party bar to go to other party bars? Then they try to get those party bars to preach. <laughs> That's what they do. <laughs> they want to take their Baba around the world. They want to print his books and circulate them widely <laughs> and so forth. <laughs> so we are a unique group for sure, within, within the Gaudiya Vaishnavism. Hmm? But it has to be understood, what, what, what is our perspective, what, we, what, what our founder, if you will, the Bhakti Vinod in the modern age, hmm? is the, my, my spiritual grandfather, the great-grandfather of some, no? I guess he's my great-great-grandfather, so great-great-great-grandfather. Hmm? Uh, uh, we have to understand, uh, properly Bhakti Vinod. Then, then if we understand properly, we're very proud to be members of Gaudi Sampradaya. We'll also understand sometimes Bhakti Vinod took some liberties to speak about it in a certain way that um, worked for a certain time and later may need to be adjusted because that the shelf life of that strategy is, is expired. Hmm? Um, ours is not to decide whether he should have invoked a particular strategy or not. Ours is to just see that overall it was a success. And now to continue its success, leaders, advanced devotees of the same lineage will address preaching strategies whose shelf life may now have expired. Hmm? That's their business. We should learn to follow them and keep the current of Bhakti Vinod alive in the world. It's very beautiful. It's not the only lineage. It's not the only way to to express or <coughs> practice, experience Gaudiya Vaishnavism, but it's a good one. Hmm? Now, there are also preaching strategies in other party bars. You may think only Gaudiya Vaishnavism. <coughs> no. Even the Babas, uh, Radha Kun, they've got preaching strategies. I can tell you some of them. Hmm? that their own students don't realize are preaching strategies. You, you, you quote Satya Narayan, Baba, whose guru is Haridas Shastri, who passed away, he got preaching strategies too. Some of the students may not even know what they are. Um, and they may still be useful. But at any rate, um, I just, this is just a preface to answering your question. <laughs> Forgive me. Um, so, <laughs> Babaji, of course, I don't know exactly what he said because you're you're saying it. Um, but I would have said it a little bit differently. I would have said that in the Bhagavatam, we don't find Namabhas and Namaparad being spoken of as stages. But we know is speaking about it. That's something a little different than we find in the Bhagavatam and in our tradition, in my lineage, and in the other lineages that I'm aware of, we don't think of it like that. But Bhakti Vinod is a very extraordinary person, and so why he did that, 
We don't know. Mm -hmm. Let's ask his senior members of his Sampradaya today what's the position there. Mm -hmm. So, if you, with regard to this particular issue, stages, Namabas, Namaparad, nama Namabas, Shudanam. What Bhakti Vinodhapur is talking about is something different than the Namabas of the Bhagavatam. Namabas of the ba Bhagavatam comes up in the sixth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam in the story of Ajamil. Hmm? Ajamil engaged in Namabas. He was thinking of something else, his son, and chanting the name of Narayan. What is the verse? Sanketya Parihasya Vastova Helena Evaba. These are four kinds of Namabas. And one of them is that you assign a, a meaning to it other than Narayan himself, and you use it like that. So, <coughs> call the name of his son, he wasn't thinking of Narayan, and he engaged in Namabas. And so, he was dying at the time. In fact, he was seeing the Yamadutas, and he called Narayan calling his son. But rather than his son coming, the Vishnu Dutas came. The carriers from Vaikuntha, the messengers of Vishnu came. The Yama Dutas are the, are, the, are the the messengers of the law. The long arm, we say in English, of the law, Yama. Hmm? You cannot get away from that. <laughs> It'll catch up to you. Hmm? So he was living a, an impious life, and so he was meant for correction. <laughs> there are consequences for action so, in the universe, so the universal scheme. So the messengers of Yama were coming to correct him. <laughs> it's time to read. He had to enter the correctional facilities for some time. <laughs> he is a disturbance to the Dharma. The world has a purpose. It's purposeful. It has a dharma. It's purpose. The whole purpose of the world is that the jivas, the tasta shakti, the jivas can have bodies, then minds, so that they can practice bhakti and go to Vaikuntha. That's the purpose of the world. There's something called the tasta shakti, like ourselves. To do anything, it's interesting because modern science thinks consciousness is dependent upon physical apparatus. And to function, it's true. <laughs> Without the physical apparatus, then we just sit still. Unless, of course, we have the spiritual apparatus of a spiritual body, constituted of the sarup shakti rather than of the maya shakti. Still, consciousness can exist independently of matter but it can't move unless it moves out of love under the influence of the Sarup Shakti. So, an aside, but the Amadutas met the Vishnadutas and for the first time and they said, hey look, this guy did this, this and this, we got it here, we've been taking notes, and this is his karma, this is his action, so there's a corresponding reaction. And the Vishnu Dutta said, you have no jurisdiction here because he has invoked the name of Narayan. Say it, Narayan, oh Narayan. And they said, we've got to talk to our a guru about this. <laughs> we never heard this before. And Vishnu Dutta spoke of the virtue of Nam. And this verse comes that even if you do the Nam in this way, a shadow of the Nam, using it for something else, still it has some power. It has the power to give mukti. Mukti means, in one sense, freedom from karma. The Yamadutas are the law messengers for karma. They had no jurisdiction because the full efficacy of Nama Bas was realized by him. It's not that anyone who does Nama Bas will always realize the full efficacy of it, but it's, it has that power. 
and there's an example of it, and that example is Ajamio. So we should think, goodness, even the shadow of the name has such power. Therefore, what to speak if we chant the, the Shudanam? Now, what is Shudanam? That it, what Nama Vas is one thing. Shudanam means the pure name. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have the Nama Aparad. Hmm? Nama Aparad means chanting and making offenses. Basically, Nama Aparad is chanting and making offenses, means you don't understand the Sambandha Gyan. You don't understand, you have not learned that there's a difference between Krishna Nam and Durga Nam and Ganesh Nam. You don't understand that. You think that Sankirtan is like um, some other yagya to get a good son. So, or something like that. You, 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 you don't have regard for the Vaishnava who bears the, who's the bearer of the name. You see, as I'm explaining them, most of the Nama Parats, you'll, you'll see, if you have some again, you won't commit them. People are chanting, they have no Sambandagyan. The chanting is not efficacious because it remains as Nama, nama Parad only. Hmm? It's not efficacious. This was Bhakti Vinod's experience in Bengal. So many people chanting, but they didn't know. They didn't have Sambandagyan. Their gurus, the so-called authorities, were not giving them the Sambandagyan. <coughs> so he made this emphasis on Siksha. People were giving Diksha, but they weren't giving any Siksha. And if you really know the Siksha, you can understand they weren't really giving Diksha. Hmm? So he said, well, give the, we should give the Siksha. What is the Sambandagyan? Because just chanting without this, people will just chant Nam Aparat. Hmm? Then they will, at most, they will get some material benefit. If you chant Nam Abbas, it's possible you're going to get Mukti. If you chant Shudanam, what is Shudanam? Shudanam in one sense is the proper conception of the name. Nam Shrestam Abhi Sachiputram Raghunathas Kusamit praise. From my guru I got the Nam Shrestam. The highest idea of the name. The conception behind the name. This is given by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Chanting the name in the context of what is Uttam Bhakti. That is Shuddha Nam. That is Shuddha Bhakti. There is Uttam, Uttam Bhakti or Shuddha Bhakti in Sadhana, in Bhava, and in Prem. Therefore there is Shuddha Nam in Sadhana, in Bhava, and in Prem. In Sadhana it will be conceptually Shuddha. You understand? I have the pure conception of what the name is, what the purpose is, is what it, what, what's the prayogen, how to chant properly. Hmm? Uh, 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 what is the significance of the name, where the name will take me, all these things. It's not understood. Hmm? With this Sambandh again, our capacity to chant will be much increased, to chant with attention, and so forth. In Bhava Bhakti, of course, Shudanam, even in Sadhana Bhakti, in Ruchi, the stage of Ruchi, where the medicine of the Nam becomes the food. First, it is like medicine. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Um, how many more? <laughs> this is counting, not chanting. <laughs> it's not good. But we take the medicine, close your eyes. <laughs> take the medicine. Don't count. <laughs> take the medicine. Then eventually the medicine becomes food. Mm -hmm. Now we chant because we're told to chant, I should chant. I have so much dying now, I should chant. Mm -hmm. Take your medicine. Did you take your medicine? Ah, yes. <laughs> but no one says, did you take your supper? I'm waiting for supper. <laughs> when is supper? <laughs> what will it be tonight? 
Will they have potatoes? <laughs> what will be? <laughs> yeah, you understand. So in Ruchi, then this medicine become food, like become supper. When can I chant? When can I chant? Hmm? Oh, and today is Ekadasi. I don't have to eat. I can chant all day. Uh, very good. I don't have to. Talk, I don't have to talk to anyone. I can say it's Ekadasi. I can just chant. This is a Ruchi. This is Shudha. Hmm? Nam Nam. What is it? Uh, Nadanam, Nadanam, Nasundarim, Kovitamba, Jagadish Kamari. Mahaprabhu says, This is Ruchi. I don't want anything from the world. Amikichit China, Amikichit China. Mama Janmani Janmanishpare, Babutat Bhakti, Hoitakiti. I only want Bhakti. I don't even care about Mukti. I'm not interested in it. Mama Janmani Janmanishpare. As long as I can love you, serve you, and wherever I am, it makes no difference. This is a high stage of sadhana bhakti. This is shuddha bhakti. Shuddha. There's no other desire. In this sense, shuddha. First we get pure conception. Then we practice that. Then purity will come. Some bandhagyan is theoretical, and then they realize some bandhagyan. In Bhav Bhakti, the Sambandha Gyan is realized. Diksha is complete. Hmm? Now one's Bhakti is fully informed. In Bhava Bhakti. Fully informed. One knows. And I'm the friend of Krishna. And I'm the, the man made in the Brahma. Hmm? Not theoretically, <coughs> even. Theoretically, we can know prior to. In Bhava Bhakti, one knows, and so his, his, his or her practice is fully informed. And Prem Bhakti, then it's fully realized. So, Shudhanam, Namabhas, Namaparad. There is the traditional, as you say, the Bhagavatam explanation. The Goswamis have followed that, but Bhakti Vinodhapur is talking about something a little different. He has posited something else. He has called it <coughs> Shraddhanamabhas. Not Namabhas, but Shraddhanamabhas. So he's saying, amongst those who have Shraddha, faith, in Uttam Bhakti, and thus have Sambandha Gyan, and are practicing. In their chanting with faith, there will be a period where the chanting is like the dawn before the sun arises. Before the sun shows, still we can find our way a little bit. Right? The sun has not come above the horizon yet, but the day has come. There's a clearing of the night, of the darkness, and a knowing the sun is coming. He said, in this state of chanting, this is a shadow of the full name within the context of Shraddha. In other words, what is described in the Bhagavatam, Sanketa Parihasiva Stovahila Nebhava, in Ajamil story, there's no Shraddha in Ajamil, in Nam, there. It's a different thing if I have faith in Nam and I'm chanting the name, but My offense of inattention, this is like the eleventh offense, that you can learn that Krishna Nam is different than Kali Nam and not equate the two and not make that offense. But you can't learn, I can't say to you today, 
chant attentively. If you don't chant attentively, then it will be offense. You cannot learn that just by hearing that. <laughs> you will go home and your mind will go somewhere else. Your mind will go somewhere else. That comes with practice and with purification of the heart. As the heart becomes purified, then the mind be can become fixed. Because the mind is being distracted by the other things in the heart, other desires. So, Bhakti Nautakas and Thakur is talking about kind of a clearing of this inattentiveness that in one sense gives rise, may give rise to other offenses as well. And he calls it Shraddhanamavas. And there is a reference in Chaitanya Chirtamrita also in the story of Haridas Thakur. Where Haridas Thakur was asked, what are the virtues of the name? And he said, well, I'll tell you one thing about the name. By chanting Nama Bas, you can get Mukti. And someone said, what? <laughs> How you can say that? If you could get Mukti by chanting Nama Bas, then I would cut off my nose. Did he say something like that? And his nose fell off. He got leprosy. His nose fell off. <laughs> he did not understand the efficacy of Nam. Mm -hmm. Haridas was saying, just the shadow of the name, it's possible that you could get Mukti. That, that people are striving for and living naked in the in the hill in the frozen mountains of the Himalayas <laughs> to get Mukti. And you said, just by Nam a boss, you can get it. <laughs> what? That's offensive. I just said, I think you are offensive. <laughs> you do not understand who is Krishna. And Krishna is non different from his name, such as his power, and, and so forth. So he wanted to speak about the power of Nam in a, in a, in a, in a negative way, just by inattentive chanting. It's possible. You can get moved. It's there in the Bible. The example is there. So he wanted to say that. But anyway, in that story there, I believe there is an explanation, a verse that speaks of this like the dawn. Hmm? Hmm? In, in the Bengal, I'd have to look at it, but I, I, I remember it. And I thought of it at the time in relation to Bhakti Vinod's explanation. So he's really speaking, he's really theologizing hmm, about the name. He's using the term Namabas in a unique way, as he did in a number of other ways. For example, um, used terms. In, for example, in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, we have the idea of the notion of Bhav Abhas, a shadow of the name, or, excuse me, a shadow of Bhava, different types of shadows, Abhases, semblances, shadow and the reflection of Bhav, and so forth. But, Bhakti Thakur used the term to say Vaishnava Abbas, Nam Abbas, uh, Bhakti Abbas. So he's theologizing and using a term uh, to <coughs> shed light on different tattvas, Bhakti tattva, Nam tattva, and so forth. And, uh, and so he's speaking about something different, a different idea of of Namabas when he invokes the term or when he uses it as a stage. He prefaces again the word Namabas with the word Shraddha. Shraddha Namabas. Hmm? That's very different than the Namabas of Ajami. That's my answer. Okay? Bhakti Vinatapo Kita. So, to follow up on that, I think there there are a number of confusions that are like that are kind of like this, where similar terms are used in different ways. Sometimes, just like fuck you know, trying to use this in an innovative way here um, in putting uh, on uh, but we have something like the different uses of. Uh, uh, Uttama Adhikari, Madhama Adhikari, Kanishka Adhikari, 
And I just said we have one use in Bhagavad Gita Samhita Sindhu. We have another Uttama Bhakta, Madhima Bhakta in the Bhagavatam, and then in Chaitanya Charitamrita a different one. And then in Sri Krishna Samhita, Bhaktivinoda Thakur has a completely different, in a completely different context. He uses Uttama Adhikari, yeah. uh, Madhima Adhikari, and Kanishta Adhikari, and, and devotees so easily get those, all those kind of conflated. And discussions like this are, just seem to me, just really important to kind of get all those things straightened out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we got an interesting party bar. <laughs> and it, it, we have to understand it. It has great power to, to, to unify and it's, it's full of innovativeness as well. Um, and we see that it's, uh, it's very, very fruitful. But it's very important at this time, historically, to understand properly the contribution of Bhakti Vinod Thakur. And um, he was a unifier, so um, there's a lot of disunity amongst the uh, Gaudi Vaishnavas, so we should think about our Paribar in light of, again, one thing is to spread it, but he wanted to unify different sects as well. So. Yes? Do you use yet some preaching strategy, strategies on us? Do you have some strategies to use on us? <laughs> <laughs> By hook or by crook, you sell a book. <laughs> I used plenty of them in the past, but uh, uh, not, not too many. <laughs> uh, no. I mean, you know, we speak on different levels. So, you know, different times we have to say things a little differently. To, it depends on where the devotee is, but I, I tend to come out with everything pretty, pretty clearly. Um, for, um, for the same reason, it, 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 that's preaching strategy too, <laughs> as a whole. What else? Uh, sometimes older sanghas say that our sangha is too liberal. Too liberal? Yeah. <laughs> our sangha too liberal. Well, that's the that's the problem with me. <laughs> I'm too, too too liberal. I um, tend to be a kind of a deconstructionist of sorts, and so that kind of preaching doesn't always galvanize people forcefully in a way that a more literal type of black and white presentation does. So if you make it real black and white, you're going to get certain people and they're going to be really ready to be really um, strict and it's like this and it's not like that. If you ask me a question, I will often answer by asking you a question and try to make you think and so forth. So there's something I'm doing on a deeper level that I feel is sometimes even more important than the form of things that I want to instill within you and put in, in your, your hearts and, and so forth. An essential understanding of Gaudiya Vajdama. It's not an excuse for not practicing, but the way I speak about it, and it's not that I don't emphasize practice, but, um, uh, but if you... But if you don't practice, I don't kick you out or you don't become, you know, a black sheep or something or I say, oh, yeah, that happens. It shouldn't, you know, that's not good. You need association. So um, other groups may be a little more, um, like I say, black and white about it and, and, and so forth. Um, that has its upside and that has its downside also. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, uh, so, uh, the way I am, it, it, it fosters that a, a little bit, but um, because yeah, you think it could be like this, it could be like that. You know? He chants four rounds, he chants 32 rounds. If I say everybody has to do it exactly like this, only 16 every day or you turn into a pumpkin. <laughs> 
then whoa. So I'm very strong about certain philosophical principles, but ways of the practice, uh, there are many ways to practice. I mean, that, that's also a principle. Hmm? You can chant many rounds, or you can um, serve the deity all day long. Other, some maybe have more penchant for hearing and, and studying. So there are different approaches. And, uh, not one size fits all necessarily, but but um, and liberal is not bad. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was liberal. I think Bhakti Vinod was very liberal. Prabhupada was very liberal. In, in the context of his own time, if you study him, he was very liberal. According to his own god brothers, Prabhu was too liberal. <laughs> For even initiating us. They thought like that. Some of them thought like that. And uh, to have women cooking temple, <laughs> very liberal. And Prabhu thought himself to be very liberal. And he was. If you look at, you know, he's from the 19th century Bengal, Calcutta, coming to America. One time, he was in Mayapur, and one of his godbrothers came to visit him for lunch. And so he sat down for lunch, and one of Prabhupada's disciples was cooking for him. I think her name is Malati, served the lunch. And so Prabhupada observed the other sannyasi. He didn't say anything, but um, it's kind of like I was with another sannyasi once, and we were taking prasadam at, at another sannyasi's ashram. It was a godbrother of mine, and the two of us were from America, and this one sannyasi was from India. So the sannyasi was eating and said, this is very nice prasadam. And the other god brother of mine said, yes, uh, Krishna Dasi cooked that. Anyway. Uh, it's that. <laughs> I'm eating food cooked by a woman. <laughs> Where am I? <laughs> we just smiled, you know. Mahaprasad was in there. Don't say, don't make any of it. So, so anyway, in this story, Prabhupada probably perceived something like that as lady came in and was serving, and Prabhupada stopped and he said, "You see her? Her name is Malati. What did he say? See that girl? Yes, she cooked this meal." But she would cut her throat for me, and I would cut mine for her. So, what is the limit? I will decide. I will decide. We have to be liberal, we have to be generous with others, and, um, but we should be less generous with ourselves. This should be our standard. To be generous with others, but tend not to be so generous with ourselves, but not to the point of neurosis. That's not good. So we don't want psychological neurosis, what to speak of, psychosis. So. <laughs> So you have to learn to work with the mind rather than against the mind. <clears throat> That's an art, the art of yoga. You have to work with it. Give it a little room sometimes and then curb it and, and so forth. Keep coming to sangha like this, keep listening to my tapes, read my books, come spend time with me in Madhavan, at Audarya, Saragrahi. Gradually, gradually, make, make progress. Listen to older devotees who've been with me, who know the philosophy. 
I want you to learn the philosophy very well. Not everybody's intellectual, and, and I understand that, but some very important points I emphasize. And, um, and I also want, I want to speak in such a way that you feel proud to be Gaudi Vaishnavas in a modern world, like you have answers to modern thought that might be uh, materialistic and so forth. And you can, stand up for tradition and know you have, you have a reasonable reply. I think that would be good for your, for your faith. So I, I try to think about things that you will run into, currents of thought, and address them so that you'll have some response to them when they arise in your own mind or hearing from others and so forth. It's a long road, hmm? long and winding road back home. So, but everyone should practice chant here, chant around. So yes, they, they, Prabhupada was also accused of being too liberal and he thought it was a compliment, so I don't think that's a, that's a compliment. But you can say, but you are too fanatical. There's, there's too liberal and there's too conservative. Also. Also, you know, circumstances are different. You know, I a bit, a bit was part of Prabhupada's mission, and I was well known in his mission. And Prabhupada personally told me that, told others in a letter, that, that I was a pillar, pillar, stone pillar, holding up this gun, one of them. So I had a prominent position, but I was. Uh, disinherited by some people who, who misinterpreted the will. And so, uh, if you look at a society, a teacher in a society that has inherited lots of temples, all types of um, backing and support from a whole institution, um, economy has books doesn't need to write any <laughs> when I by force of circumstance and my spiritual conviction had to leave ISKCON then the Bhakti Vedanta Book Trust would not sell me Prabhupada's books to sell to other people and then <laughs> that's how bad I was <laughs> so, therefore, I started to write books. Some of them criticized, why you write your own books? And, well, this is why. <laughs> why don't you write, pro why aren't you distributing property books? Well, you wouldn't sell them to me then. So I wrote my own, and now I've got a bunch of them, I have to sell them. <laughs> so, when I first wrote my Bhagavad Gita commentary, that was uh, more than 15 years ago. That was a shockwave. Yeah. Who is he to write Bhagavad Gita? Prabhupada already wrote Bhagavad Gita. Hmm? Now three, four, five, six people in this con there have written Bhagavad Gita. Translation, translation, I think, from Kridayananda Maharaj, from Ranchor, from Garuda. Hmm. Yeah. I paved the way for them. I took all the heat, all the criticism. And, and, and everybody said, oh, he's bad, don't read his book. And then other people came out and they read them. Oh. So I'm a little bit like that, ahead of the curve in some respects. And, uh, and, um, and so my point is that um, when, you have to, when you have to stand on the street dressed like this, in your pajamas, and you have no mission, no, no big movement, nobody says, he's a guru, you know, here's his seat, whatever, he, can, he will fly in here or there, he's got, he can go to India and thousands of people will come in Mayapur to hear from him, hear the Bhagavatam. You don't have any of that, you've been disinherited now, you're just on the street, then you have to, you know, start anew and 
be a little creative, <laughs> be a little liberal, like Prabhupada was a little liberal in the beginning. Hmm? He said, Prabhupada said, I gave out the Harinam as an experiment to see what would happen. <laughs> That's what he says. I was giving it out to see what, how it would affect these people, what would happen. And as it affected them, and they came forward and said, Prabhupada, I think there should be a temple in San Francisco. Then Prabhupada thought, Krishna is saying there should be a temple. <laughs> yes, there should be a temple there. Go there. This is how he spread his movement. So in the beginning also you can see that he was more liberal. He used to do the laundry for the devotees in New York. And he would cook for them and so forth. He would actually talk to them. <laughs> it might be that what seems liberal nowadays might not seem liberal in the future. That's true. That's true. Yeah. So, but what I'm saying is that, um, you know, your group might be a little more um, intimate, a little more informal mm -hmm. um, in its formative period and it's still formative, <laughs> something like that. This has got, you know, decades of rules and things so they can be very strict. And... Prabhupada wanted his mission to run on the basis of two uh, rules. The rules were love and trust. So I, we try to run our group like that. I love you, I trust you. If I find out I can't trust you, then I'm just, just a little disappointed, but um, we try again, <laughs> something like that. Okay, so what is the time? Eight. Eight? Okay, we stop there. We have more questions tomorrow. Bhaktivinoda Puribar ki jai. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada ki jai. Tirakshak Shida Dev Kosami Maharaj ki jai. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada ki jai. Bhaktivinoda Puribar ki jai. Gaur Nityananda ki jai. Gaur Aramada ki jai. Siddharji Gopal ki jai.